Yo, what up? Welcome to another episode of the Oakland Warriors podcast. I'm Patrick, and this is actually a feed drop from uh, an episode I just did on the Across the Cavs podcast with my friend Zach Weiss. Uh, We used to be on the same podcast network together. He's a hardcore Cavs fan and just a knowledgeable basketball dude in general. So uh, fun talk talking about uh, the Warriors' unfortunate two losses to his Cleveland Cavaliers coming right up. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome inside the latest edition of Across the Cavs on Sunday, November 12th. We're talking Cavs Warriors. We got Patrick Epino of the Oakland Warriors pod introducing him right after this on Network 216. All right, welcome back, folks. Patrick Epino has been here before. We were both in the TBPN, the Basketball Podcast Network, also known as Hoops Podnet Together. We're both still going. He's the Oakland Warriors. You got to cross the Cavs. And Patrick, you knew we had to do this because when the Cavs and Warriors play pretty much forevermore, as long as Steph is still around, Clay is still around, Draymond is there, there is always going to be history between these two teams. Yeah, absolutely. What I've enjoyed so far this season is watching the Warriors play all these teams that have kind of turned over from the beginning of the dynasty. And it's like a whole new category of players. So it's the Rockets, it's the Cavs, it's it's other teams. So uh, uh, I'm enjoying it. And uh, the Cavs are always one of my favorite teams to watch right now, to be honest. And quick question on the Rockets. I wasn't planning. This is unplanned, but you mentioned the Rockets. They've won six in a row, not playing either of their first-round picks. Uh, Amen Thompson is hurt. Cam Whitmore demoted to the G League. Are they a legitimate playoff team? I don't think so, not in the West. I mean, unless somebody gets – just decimated by injuries you know they could threaten for like a a play-in spot but i just think the west is so stacked up top and then you have a lot of young up-and-coming teams similar to the rockets who are just a maybe a step ahead a year or two ahead of them so i like them i like what uh uh, they turned into and i'm actually kind of impressed i'm really surprised yeah i'm i really didn't think dylan brooks was all that but i I have to say I, I don't like him at all, and I'm not the first to say it. I, the, the Don thing last year still rubs me the wrong way, but he's actually playing good basketball. And saying that on a recording is not something I expected to say for the rest of my life. But yeah, yeah, as a as a as a Warriors fan, like you know Grizzlies, all that stuff. Uh, I loathe uh, Dylan Brooks, but um, you know he's got something going there. I think Van Vliet. Has helped, of course, as well, and Doka. Uh, uh, but you know, we'll see. We'll see how it pans out for those dudes. And then for the Warriors, you know, they've been up and down in the early season. You watch them sometimes, like, oh my God, they're unstoppable. You watch Chris Paul leading the league in assists, the turnover ratios after Mike Conley's insane turnoverless streak ended when he picked up four the other night. He's done a lot of impressive things with the second unit. Draymond's come back, and it seems like he's had a little bit more offense this year. But then you had Clay has struggled with his shot. Wiggins is ice cold. Looney is still very minimal as far as his non-rebounding and rim-protecting value. Not that that goes unnoticed. Not that it's not important. But we're talking about an 82-game season. You're trying to find guys to score. And Kaminga and Moody have stretches but not whole games. So is it an issue, Patrick, that Dario Saric, outside of Steph, has the most points scored in a single game this season with exactly 20? Yeah, he's the only other guy on the team who scored 20 points at all. Not Clay, not Wiggins, not coming off the bench, not Chris Paul. Um, it's an issue. Um, I just got to say, first and foremost, that uh, my early season watching the Warriors, I'm ecstatic because – Last season was such a drag, and you just knew that there was something happening underneath after the, you know, uh, Draymond Poole thing. But um, now it's like, okay, you just worry about basketball, what's going on. And I like what I've seen so far, but, I mean, there's there's serious flaws right now, right? Like, it's like they don't do well against bigger teams, let alone bigger athletic teams like the Cavs uh, up front. And they uh, are still searching for consistency from Wiggins um, and, and, and Clay. My optimistic side is like, yo, we're not dealing with off-the-court BS right now. So if, if everything gravitates to the mean, or at least close to it, 
then I feel pretty good. And I think Mike Dunleavy as the new GM replacing Bob Myers, uh, he, he's been impressive. And I think he might be more aggressive with the roster spots that they tend to leave open. And if they need a big, maybe they figure out a way to get one. Depends on who comes free. But we know, as you know, it's a long season. And, uh, you know, it's about just building – uh, building forward. If it gets to 20 games and Wiggins is still looking bad and uh, Clay always comes around, but like Wiggins is still looking bad, then you might have to, you know, rejigger some things perhaps. Yeah, you know, I guess we'll see how things shake up, but some of the numbers from the non-Steph Warriors last night, Wiggs was 6 for 12, minus 13, Clay was 5 of 16. He did get hot late in the contest. He finished with 14, but it was Definitely too late from him. Chris Paul, nine points, nine assists. Only three turnovers. We say only three, but all three of them were surprising. Really, none of them good passes. And, uh, the Really, the highlight had been how little he'd been doing that. Kamenga, eight of 11 at the line, two of seven from the field. Moody, two of four. Dario, two of five. GP12 had some athletic moments, but was a minus 12 as well. I did like the Trace Jackson Davis minutes. He really didn't add much outside his offensive rebound. Drew a foul, got a point. And Corey Joseph and Brandon Podziemski getting some um, late run. And on the other side, a really nice balance for Cleveland, honestly. Donovan seemed like he played better than a 7 of 22, added seven boards, five assists. Darius, 19, 6 and 4 with five steals. Karras off the bench, 22, 5, 3, 4 steals, and a very impressive block on Clay. Dean Wade's back to back threes in the fourth quarter went a long way for the Cavs. Jared Allen's minutes up to 28. Evan Mobley, 19 and 5. Struce with 16, 8 and 4. And all of this was enough, Patrick. And I'm happy because it's been a long time. I didn't realize how long it had been since the Cavs had had regular season success against the Warriors in two games in a row. This was the first time since the 09 10 season. That was Stephen Curry's rookie campaign. At some point there, they started making a bunch of trades and retooling. They may have had Darrell Wright. Did you always have Darrell Wright that year? Uh, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. He, he may have been like a year or two later. Yeah, he might have been on the Keith Smart regime. But the, the reason I bring that up is because, guys, we're talking about Darrell Wright. I'm not knocking him. <laughs> I liked him a lot. Darrell Wright on the Warriors was an 18-per-game guy. He was very good. I really enjoyed the Keith Smart Warriors only got one season because they won 36 games and they're still like, eh, Mark Jackson. Mark Jackson set, set the blueprint. He helped you guys get four titles. Or, but was four titles? Yeah, four titles overall. He set the blueprint. Steve Kerr. Mark, he walked so Steve could run. But the, whole, the point of that being that it's been a minute, 14 years. That might have also been, correct me if I'm wrong, the first year of the David Lee contract, or was that a year before? He might have still been a no. It was pre David Lee even coming over. It, it, it was David Lee came, I think, 2010. Yeah, maybe so, the right. next season. Yeah, David Lee was not even a warrior yet. And keep in mind, David Lee going to the Warriors was one of the biggest moves in the NBA at the time, leaving the Knicks after another his second 2010 season, and getting an all star nod. He was a big deal at that time, not just being married to a tennis star. There's, there's two things he was known for. Well, well more on that later. <laughs> but thoughts with that said, and they finally got a sweep. We, the Cavs finally, at least for now, can celebrate something against the Warriors. It's been a long time, seven years since they've been able to celebrate anything against them, and 14 years in the regular season. Who's got a better short-term outlook between now and the All-Star break, in your opinion? Oh, that's, that's a tough one because I think that I like the Cavs. Uh, obviously, I like the Warriors. I think the uh, short term, and it's a toss up to me. I'll say I'll say Warriors. Uh, I think I think the thing about the Cavs is just like I said earlier, they're a really really bad matchup with the Warriors. Uh, if the Warriors make it to the finals, hopefully the Cavs aren't there. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think again, like you know, the Warriors, they're it's a long season and they're pacing and they know they have a bunch of old heads. And they know what it takes to get to where they need to be. Unlike a lot of young teams, I mean, you've seen veteran teams, you've seen young teams, and a lot of young teams are trying to uh, always push and press because they don't know how far, how much it takes to get to where they need to go. And I think for the for the Warriors, you know, if they end up 
top four, I'm okay in the West. You know, that's that's good for me. Can you, uh, wait, can you say I'm okay in the West anymore? <laughs> I, I didn't necessarily say I'm okay in the West. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, because once they get to the playoffs, you know, they can win on the road and all that stuff. But I, I like the Cavs a lot. I think um, they're a really – and like you said, they're well balanced. I've always liked Jared Allen. I've always liked Evan Mobley. Uh, I, I'm actually pretty impressed how uh, uh, Donovan Mitchell and uh, Garland play well together as such a short backcourt. Um, it's good that they have such tall dudes up front. Uh, and I mean, let me, I'm curious. Uh, do you how far do you think they could get? Like, what's your, what was your preseason prediction for them in the East? Do you think they get past like the the other guys the top? There was no direct, I think they're going to finish here, but it has to be get past the first round just for as a, as a floor, you lose in the first round again, you're going to have a lot of problems going into the off season because as it stands right now, even in spite of last postseason, these guys are happy. And yes, it's not the best stuff. Cavs have been sluggish. They've been injured, but they are happy together. Don, I've not seen Donovan Mitchell th- this happy before. I'm not saying he wasn't in Utah. He loved it there, but when he's on the court, if there's something going on, he hides it brilliantly because he loves it here, which is, I think, the most important part of this core and what can happen. But it has to be, at worst, a six-game uh, knockout in round two because you have to show that you can hang with the big the big dogs. Uh, ideally, the Cavs find a way into I, – I, it probably won't happen. It's almost impossible. But I was hoping low-key to sneak into one. My thought was that they were – I had them at two before Boston made their trades. And as soon as they brought in Drew to compliment Kristaps, I thought you get rid of Kristaps, you, you get rid of Rob, you get rid of Smart, you're falling down a slight peg for the regular season. I thought they were going to drop to three. I had Bucks one, Celtics two, Cavs three coming into the year, but I totally discounted the Sixers and do hope Kelly Oubre is okay reading about the hit and run last night. Pretty scary mm-hmm. stuff for him – walking around in the city he plays in for that to happen and the person just drive off. So you do hope he recovers because they've really impressed me with Nick Nurse. The Harden trade gives them depth pieces and it's pretty clear they didn't need him because I think what they did need. Also getting rid of P.J. Tucker gives you a little more offensive versatility, not knocking P.J., who I think still has a lot of value. Melton can shoot from the two spot if you need him to, but he can defend the best player as a starter now. It gives you a real bench. Nick Nurse is managing this team better than Rivers was. I know it's only been nine games. So my hope, avoid any of those three in the first round, please. And if you can, the Knicks, if you play the Knicks again, I guess we'll see. They had two interesting meetings recently. Mitchell Robinson's averaging seven offensive rebounds a game right now. Holy crap, man. Um, (laughs) I'd say now, updated prediction. I'd love a conference finals trip get that experience for everybody, but I think you have to get to round two. So my, my hope is a competitive second round series against whoever you match up with first round. Just, I don't care if it takes seven and if it has to be a uh, comeback winning game seven, whatever it is, you have to clear round one. Cause there's all people are already talking about the coaching situation, whether they're right or not, I'm not going to say, but you're talking about get rid of your coach this early in the season. You look at the teams that have done that before the Suns, whether a Watson, the Lakers with Mike Brown, the Rockets with McHale. It never works. It will yeah. never work that early in a season. Ty Lue at six games. If you, if you need a change it that early, you, you came in with this whole plan. And you're pretty much throwing the offseason regime away by doing it this early. You have to give it time. Yeah, yeah. That all, that all makes, uh, makes sense because, like, I look at the Cavs and, like I said, couple times already they're, they're a bad matchup for the Warriors but I think like you know when it comes to the Cavs matching up against the best teams in the east like there's obstacles that the Warriors don't have uh but then when the Warriors face other teams who are at the top like they match up better with those guys so you know it's uh this was what I was looking for from the Warriors like how they play against uh, Jokic in Denver how they play against the Cavs twice in one week which didn't turn out well uh and then You know, these are the data points that the front office needs to figure out, like, okay, do we really need to make a move? Uh, Is are are the guys that they have enough? Can they figure it out? And right now they they haven't because what they need is a full team effort. 
to beat teams with size and with big ends of clay being a little bit inconsistent. And as you said earlier, like Kaminga, I love Kaminga. Uh, I like Moody a lot. And the, uh, but the inconsistencies from all those wings, you know, uh, it, it can't be there. So, you know, um, eventually though, I think those things will tighten up. They know the pace of the season. Uh, if there's any terrible injuries to any of the uh, Warriors core or the old dudes, then uh, then we're talking resetting expectations. But you also kind of bake in like 20 missed games for some of these guys uh, and just hope that they come back uh, right when the playoffs start or at least like a month before or something and they can ramp up and, and just take, take care of 16 wins. As Wiggins came back right at the last second last year, I did he play? Did he play the regular season, or was it right for the playoffs? Was it, was it a week before the, the playoffs? Yeah, he just came in for the playoffs and he started, and then um, Kaminga went to the bench. Kaminga was playing well; he's playing 25, 30 minutes a game, and he was doing he was he was showing out. But then when Gary Payton got healthy and um, and uh, Wiggins came back from his absence, uh, Kerr went with them, and you know Kaminga kind of went a little in the tank. And he needs a little bit of run to to get some of those uh, mistakes out of the system. I mean, if he played for another team these past two plus years, he would have had gotten all, a lot of the those uh, nineteen year old mistakes back then out. You know, the way like sometimes you look at Jalen Green, he's looking a little bit, you know, better. But uh, Kamenga still needs to work on his handle and some of his decision making, and those are things that you don't. Uh, get just from sitting on on the bench so much, you know. At least there's there's no uh, Anthony Lamb in front of him in the rotation anymore. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people are happy about that with what happened well before he even got to the Warriors. Uh, you know. Yeah, I mean, talking about bad karma for the Warriors last season, you had the Draymond thing, you had the Anthony Lamb thing, and just you know, not not good vibes. But you know, that's all in the past. That's Although what's what not what's not in the past, and whether you like it or not, I don't watch as many Warriors games as you do. <laughs> Draymond Green picked up an early tech. He was smiling. He was getting the crowd going. The free throw was missed by Donovan Mitchell, and I think it was arguing. Uh, if I remember correctly, he was the first tech was just arguing a call that he didn't like. I think that was when uh, he picked up the foul. Uh, Niang, it was something with him and Niang, right, was the first one. Uh, down yeah, below the rim, so, someone yeah. called someone yeah. down. And it's hard to see the play. I think that was his third personal at the time. Something. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I mean, you know. Uh, I thought it was a weird way to eject somebody <laughs> like after the fact and whatnot. Um, but, you know, you know, it wasn't the cause of the loss uh, with these things with Draymond, like uh, you, you kind of accept it or whatever. Sometimes he gets ejected and whatnot. Sometimes he fires the guys up in, in a good way. But uh, I, I mean, I personally think it's, it is kind of a, it was too weird of a call to make like that. Like literally like reviewing one and then going back, to the other yeah, be like, hey, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna get rid of this guy right now. It was it was weird because again, I most people that support the Cavs hate him now. Of course, when they play, I'm it's whatever you know. Until he does something, whatever. And I know that there's a Jared Allen kick during game one as well. And no <laughs> one said anything about I. I didn't really acknowledge that either. There's nothing to post on that. Thought about it, but. I don't dislike Draymond like that, and I kind of wish I did in a sense, only because I think he is just so smart. He gets on this pod, and and he's spouting off this this brilliance. And, but then you and, and I know everyone sees it different. There was a Sabonis thing in the playoffs last year, and at the time, like, I understand he didn't start it, but there is a such thing as going too far and, and whatnot, and everything that happens. And I look at this. And it's not as bad, nearly, as what I've seen in the past, you know, uh, from him. And on that second tech, you know, it is weird that uh, they they ejected him for retaliation. But I think the only reason they would even consider that is because, and normally they don't do this. It has to be a reputation thing. Donovan shoves him. It wasn't, I didn't think it was malicious. Now, it was a shove. It was a, okay, man, stop it. It mm -hmm. was a retaliation show, which I do appreciate only being a common foul because it it was low-key where he was holding the basketball. Did he have the ball? Yeah, Draymond was bringing the ball up, I believe, on that play. 
but I, I am confused going back, but I guess the only justification, Patrick, and you tell me if I'm wrong, is because the immediate action, I didn't even see the shove on the other end in real time. That's why I was confused uh, when Donovan did that. I, I hadn't seen it when it happened. Um, it had to be because it was an immediate following, and we're like, wait, we're going to review the play, and perhaps reviewing the play constitutes like where was donovan coming from when he shoved he may have been recovering from the previous shove if anything because it was the same motion so it was certainly interesting yeah but that's that's my thought on it yeah i mean reputation is is it you know what i mean like you said no one's gonna go back and look at uh clay thompson <laughs> uh in a play like that if you drop him in draymond's place uh, and like I said, it, it is what it is and you live with it. It's been, um, you know, Draymond gets, uh, uh, a lot of text because of his reputation, but, uh, on the flip side, he gets a lot of latitude because of reputation. You know what I mean? Cause you'll, you'll get a guy who doesn't talk, yell at the refs and he'll get like the double tech and, and tossed, but Draymond can go on for like, you know, in between plays during free throws and all that stuff. So he gets a little bit of latitude um, in this one. It, you know, uh, it's, yeah, I thought it was weird. I think it's hundred percent reputation. It, it bugged me, but then at the end of the day, uh, that's not why they lost this game. And there's a lot of bigger issues that the Warriors need to address in the medium to short term to make sure that they are on the path that they're supposed to be on. You know? Oh, for sure. And it's, been a weird start for them as well i think the difference between this year and last year and it's very early but it's that they've shown they could actually win away from home because they won like eight road games last year it's the weirdest thing i've ever seen where they go to the bay area they don't lose they leave and it's like they go from warriors to as you call the nines they go from warriors to uh hired plumbers for the night you forget how to win <laughs> I mean, they're playing at a higher level than the plumbers. Quotes, anyone listening on audio, that's, there's their air quotes. But <laughs> in just the last two minutes of the game, something always goes wrong if it's close. They lost all those games on the road. Yeah, I mean, I've talked about this a lot, too, on my show. It's like all last season, you know, people were pontificating on, like, what the Warriors' problem was. And, you know, everybody gets up for the champs. Everybody gets up for the dynasty Warriors, whatever. And people were like – you know, looking at like how well other teams shot when the Warriors came to their arenas and stuff. And it's like, okay, yeah, that's fine. But the Warriors have encountered that before. They've gotten everybody's best shot. Uh, at the end of the day, we all knew that the, the vibes were, were whack and like uh, that something was going on. And it's like the chemistry was terrible. And, you know, you go on the road, the Warriors are famous early dynasty for like hanging out. Uh, viral videos on the plane after, you know, winning their first title um, and going to dinners, all this stuff, getting along, right? But last season, I'm pretty sure they just did not enjoy being on the road. So that cohesiveness going into another arena, just, you know, it would fall apart at the most inopportune times. So that's why when people talk about like, oh, the, the road, I worry about the road for the Warriors. I'm like, I, I don't, you know, I don't. I think it'll, it'll be closer to what it usually is in terms of, uh, uh, their, you know, in rel relation to their home record. So I'm not worried about that at all. And, and I'm encouraged because what they're five and two on the road. <laughs> I mean, they're what one and one and two at home now or something. Uh, but again, like, I'm, I don't mean to be just like, Oh, it's fine. You know, ah, we're, we're good. But you know, that's one thing that, winning four titles and going to the finals six times also experiencing a lot of like lows with those highs and that's what it gets you it's like okay we've we've seen this before we know the pacing of this and it, it also as a podcaster who's covered this team like almost pretty much every game for the last three and a half years or so it's like all right yeah like, this is we're in a better spot than we were last season and as long as like you know this box gets checked that box gets checked uh, we're, we'll be all right going into round one, knock on wood. And the team you almost saw two years ago, the Miami Heat, who did get 
somehow get to it a year later. I mean, they've been off to an interesting start. No one's playing for them anymore. They, they got, they're already digging into the two ways on the rotations. You know, uh, shout out to Haywood Highsmith, though, going from Division Two to a starter on the defending conference champions, I guess. I do like him. But Max Struess was playing for the Heat. But I guess shout out. The reason, I guess, I give I give a relevant shout out. Max Struess. I wore this for Max Struess. You know the real reason I wore this. But I'm going to tell everybody it is for Max Struess, who is going to be our final talking point here as we finish up on the Cavs. 16, 8, and 4 last night. He's hitting timely shots. He's grabbing rebounds. Like he's a few inches taller, he's moving the ball, he's on cuts. Uh, to me, he has proven to be what the Cavs missed from the small forward spot since LeBron left again. It's a guy that can be versatile within the offense. He can score here and there, but he'll get rebounds, he'll move the needle. He's not stagnant, he's always in motion. He's not just going to, and if he's waiting in the corner, it's only going to be a couple of times a game. So having now seen him twice in a week, uh, Patrick will finish up with this and see such an important part of the Cavs and what they want to do. Thoughts on Max Struess and what you saw from him in these two meetings. I mean, I liked him in Miami. I, I was surprised. I was like, who's this dude? <laughs> but um, I think it's a good pickup. What's his contract? It was four yeah. years. I don't know. It's like, Four years, 64, but we're going to go to Spotrack to confirm this. A great site if you've never used it. See, it's Keith Smith. Excellent Pony. site. Four years, 62. Okay, four years, 62. Yeah, four, about four years, 62, everything is guaranteed. Yeah, All guaranteed. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I like him. Uh, he's he's a great glue guy. You know what I mean? He does all those little things. Uh, I mean, as you know, it's like when you have a team and you want them to – to compete, you put a team that you want to compete for a title. You got to find like the, you know, a few stars or like you know your top tier star and a couple other uh, second tier guys, and then those glue guys who are smart, heady, can do things. And I'm just looking at his averages for the season. I mean, uh, it's solid, right? Like, and he does those things that I didn't think he would continue to do. To be honest, I didn't think he would. Uh, continue to do this stuff after leaving the the heat but the dude's legit and what he's like only 27 years old so he's still getting into his prime and he doesn't rely on athleticism so everything that he does is uh gonna be there for a while barring any kind of injury and whatnot um and he's one of those guys that i think you know just intangible guys right like one of those dudes who uh, may, you know, there's guys that put up numbers and then there's guys that also like make the smart plays and, and do the things that help a team win and not to just like blow smoke, but, um, I'm, I'm impressed by the dude. And I think that, uh, uh, I don't, I don't know what his ceiling is per se, but I think just as a glue guy, when you have, uh, Donovan, when you have, um, Darius Garland, and Mobley, you know, he fits right in there. You know, and he's not demanding shots. He plays in the flow. And, uh, you know, I, um, he, he played well against us. Nice. So, so that sucks. <laughs> but, um, you know, you like to see these, these guys who are, I guess, you know, basically underdogs because I didn't know much about him before he made noise with the Heat. Uh, you like to see these guys come out of the woodwork and have continued success even when they, when they get paid. So, you know. Props to props to him and props to the Cavs for picking him up. Had some good college competition, I think, against the Big East. That when he finally got a chance, his third year in the league, we played two games with Chicago. Spent the, uh, some time on a two-way. Second year, our first year with the Heat, didn't see the court as, as much. And then kind of like Duncan Robinson route, where he gets minutes a little bit at the end of a season, then carries it over because it took a couple of years for Duncan Robinson to get into the starting lineup, and he also played but six years in college. Because he played five, or he played what, four years with the gap year because of his uh, transfer, especially when you transfer into Division One, usually you have to wait a year and whatnot. But I, I've loved him so far. He had uh, a double double already. He's had two point rebound double doubles. It's seven threes on opening night, and I don't really mind the percentages haven't been as high because he's confident. He's putting them up. He's impacting the game in so many ways. I think he's one of the most valuable role players across the league right now, even as we've seen so many teams surprise 
Well, the Cavs, like the, the Warriors, six and four, you guys are fine. So far, record wise, Cavs are at four and five. They've blown a 10 point lead with just under three minutes already this year. They lost two to the Thunder in the way they beat the Warriors twice. They lost twice to Indiana as well, a team within the division and in season tournament foe. Not that that's going to affect where they end up in the playoffs, but these are uh, the Pacers on one hand are a team that I had as actually my most ideal first round matchup of anybody with my last episode before I was like as a guest on an episode somewhere else. And my prediction was that Indiana would be the easiest team to beat in the first round out of every single team they may have to face. And I've already had to eat my words because their athletic ability and their three point shooting gives the Cavs nightmares. So I, I guess we'll see, right, Patrick, it's only November 12th. The season's 18 or 19 days old. We'll take the wins as they come. And once we get, toward January, we can have actual concerns should we need them at right then for either of us. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Like, I'm already, like, uh, after these losses to the Cavs and the uh, the Nuggets, it's, it's, like, a lot of murmuring of, like, oh, my God, we got to trade Wiggins. <laughs> we got to send him to the bench and all this stuff. And it's, like, no, 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 not yet. Like, it's a the season, it's, it's, a, it's a long time. Uh, and, uh, you know, and that's, that's why we watch, right? And that's why they have this, uh, in-season tournament so that like you kind of watch more, I suppose. So it is what it is. That's fair. And any, any last thoughts here, Patrick, about the Cavs or about the Warriors before? We I do. Play? I do. Cause, cause, uh, uh I, I just want to ask you, how's Evan Mobley tracking? Uh, because I'm a big fan, uh, but I haven't watched him as much. And is he... He was heralded after the second, after his first year, and then um, is he still tracking to be that guy that everybody thought he was going to be at the beginning of last season? I think it depends which person you're asking, because half of people on Cavs Twitter are just like, "Yeah, bust. He doesn't have a jumper <laughs> anymore. He doesn't have this." He's this, but he's been good on the glass. He's started to finish inside. His rim protection has been there for sure. I think the only issue with Mobley was he wasn't ready to be a full-time five and with Jared Allen missing the start of the season. And the second option being Tristan Thompson uh, as the backup big, you you really can't start him in the same way. So they were starting a little smaller. They kept uh, switching up the lineups to begin the campaign. So since Allen came back and Evan has actually been at the four, I will give you his exact numbers and then explain good or bad last three games, 13 and 16, 22 and five, 19 and five. So the rebounds going down mean absolutely nothing. Obviously two of those games were against you guys. He's finishing when he needs to. I think he's improved his free throw shooting and his, he's the current uh, DPOY uh, number two candidate. I believe he's number two right now, according to something I saw yesterday from early, early odds. They can't score over him. He's making life hell in the posts, and I really don't care if he has a jumper right now. He'll need it later. Right now, he hasn't. Last year, he was hitting some three. This year, he's got nothing. The Coral's also missed the last couple games, so they've missed him tremendously on that end of the floor. But Mobley tracks, man. Uh, Might not be an all-star yet. Like I hoped he might be, but he gets inside. He'll finish over guys, and I don't think he's scared. I think he's as we the season's gone on, he's playing less afraid on the defensive end. With the Grizzlies at one and eight, no one's talking about JJJ anymore. Mobley's going to get that type of attention. I think that he's had in the past. We're not stat sheet stuffing his blocks. I I can't I can't speak for the people at the table, but I'm pretty sure that's the case. No one's stat sheet stuffing for Mobley. He's getting one block game, but his impact feels like five or six some nights. I love what he's doing, and obviously, I know you love him as the so him being a SoCal product. I am a huge Mobley guy right now. Do you think, um, you know, do you see him being like the best player ultimately in that draft class? Oh boy, I'm gonna have to quickly pull this up because I know there's a lot. All right, I'm I'm pulling this up now, real quick. So the competition is Scotty, Giddy, Franz, Cade. And what, Shangoon, pretty much? Yeah, I guess Shangoon's uh, worked his way up. Who else is there? Uh, let's see. 
Cades looked really nice this year. Jalen Green, I really can't say I've watched enough of. Uh, there's a lot of players I've seen a lot of. He's not one of them. I'm impressed by Giddy and Suggs. Scotty looks unbelievable this year. Um, amazingly, I was ready to keep calling him overrated. I, I think that's a little irrational of me, truthfully, because he does have game, and I'm still salty over the rookie of the year thing. And then watching him brick ten layups with uh, was it with Giddy in the that the three the three by three event that they do now. No, I didn't see that. Saturday nights, All Star Weekend. Ever, anyway, uh, he can be. I think he has to really, really impress. I think he has to play well at the highest level. So in the playoffs, deep playoff runs, to mm-hmm. be better than because his regular season numbers won't across the board be better than Cade or Jalen Green. Maybe Shangoon. It really depends because he has a bit more offensive upside. So far, he's proved it. Otherwise, Mobley might still be a better finisher, but shangun has got the floater, he's got the jumper, he's got the fakes, and he has a new system right now that I think is helping him. He's playing with a lot of vets. The Rockets were only young last year. They really changed that in the offseason. So he has the chance to be, but right now, I think he just has to keep dominating defensively. I think I do think he'll get a couple of deep plays in his career, and this year could be one of them. But you know, obviously, Wemby, Gobert, I think Gobert's number one right now. Again, he, he deserves it, but He'll get yeah. he'll he'll get to that point of we can say when we're talking about Cade after he's been healthy for a couple of years and we're talking about Franz whose upside also is insane right now and some of these other players like Scotty I think he'll be in the conversation and it might just come down to who you're asking if he's better than or not. Nice, very thorough. I'm hoping uh, for the best for that guy because I, I I like I like Mobley and whenever there's a, a dude with that kind of talent you just want to see see it beached you know what i mean so uh you know good luck to good luck to him love a good unicorn you know you gotta you gotta love the big guys that count he'll get to unicorn status once he starts making threes i was thinking about when he was in my head when we were talking about mobley for a second there and i was also thinking the decoy so it, it, it where, where it slipped out but nonetheless you know that uh that should finish up today at patrick yeah. you know uh, good luck to the Warriors, Patrick, the rest of this season. Let's see if we magically meet in the most unexpected final ever. <laughs> I, I hope not. I hope not. Like I said earlier, you guys are a bad matchup. But so I hope that. you guys do get to the finals. That means you guys found something. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, okay. I, I, you got to shore up. You got to make sure you have the perfect bench rotation that everyone that's coming in the game is – playing at a high level when you need it. I think they're still trying to refine that with Niang struggling to shoot and Wade being hit or miss with the Coral being out. It hurts a lot of things. They're still trying to figure out that extra big situation. That was the last night was the first time all season that Evan and Allen were the only two bigs. There were no Damian Jones or Tristan getting rotation minutes on the end of the game. So we'll see, but Patrick Epino can be found right at the Oakland Warriors pot, Oakland Warriors across all platforms. Uh, the ones that matter. YouTube, Twitter, leave it down. All right. Patrick Capino, Zach Weiss, across the Cows on Network 216.